Welcome to season two, episode seven of The Open Educator. The best place to be on a Tuesday morning. Thank you for joining us and for taking the time to professionalizing your student experience. And I would like to encourage everyone, if you have a camera, to please turn it on and be present with us, shoulder to shoulder with like-minded, motivated individuals, and to listen with intention. The USF Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program has three main pillars. One, we build individuals to create their own company and to grow it, a very traditional way of looking at entrepreneurship. We also empower students to work for firms and be entrepreneurs or corporate innovators, those who create new products, services, businesses, and extract value from ideas. And lastly, we empower students to create and define careers that they, they define themselves, not what others define for them. To create new ways and new jobs and careers that don't exist, that mash up your passion, your interest, your motivation to live the life that you want. And today's guest is doing that. So our next guest is a great example who's identified a gap in the market that isn't being met and choosing a unique way of creating a service and a business and offering to this underserved clients. Like many, his journey isn't a straight line to create his own venture and his own company. And his business is a wonderful example, and maybe you've heard of this term, service as a service, or particularly professional services as a service, and how the concept of the business model can be arranged or developed to create value, not just for his company, but for every one of his stakeholders and clients that he works with. He is owner and founder of Lonzo Law. So please give a warm welcome to Kevin Lonzo. And we do this through sign language, which is applause while we have our mics on silent. So Kevin, welcome. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday morning. What does this, where does this cast find you? And can you bring us up to speed on Lonzo Law and services and what you've been doing? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. Um, Lonzo Law is, uh, a legitimate boutique law firm um, that I started about three and a half years ago, and it was a brainchild of me feeling stuck in big law and corporate law. And it kind of came to fruition when I brought a client on to my old firm and realized that my client, who was a friend of mine and a small business owner, was getting charged at a rate that was about two times the rate that, you know, Allstate was being charged at. Um, the whole concept in big law is that if you have more hours, you have a lower rate, uh, an economy of scale kind of situation. And I personally didn't really like that because my friend's business needed legal help and we were basically trying to cut him out of the market because, you know, in, in candidness, my partner told me, it's not really worth worrying about if we have them or not. It doesn't make sense. Um, and from their perspective, big law has a lot of overhead, you know, tall towers, marble floors, all that stuff. So they have a lot of expenses to carry. So they want the bigger clients. So I branched out on my own three and a half years ago and realized that there's a way to do this in a leaner way. Um, and it was an opportunity in this market to be able to try and target small businesses and entrepreneurs who are all these crumbs that get you know knocked out of the ability to have legal representation and then are forced to do it themselves which ultimately means they have to get a lawyer later to fix it when it costs about three times as much wonderful so what kevin has shared is there's this institutional structure at least within big law you might find some similarities in other industries certainly big consulting but maybe other corporate areas and he said, well, that structure is kind of ignoring a segment of the market, particularly small businesses or entrepreneurs who maybe we know from our coursework or other readings, oftentimes, or legal is a, could be a barrier, it could be a trend, it could be something that we have to engage with as a stakeholder. And of course, law is complex. We can't be experts in everything. Sometimes we need experts and certainly, uh, providing services to small, medium size and, and entrepreneurs is, is one niche and Kevin's trying to fill that. So let's break down a little bit more. So 
of course, we talked about big law and we said, all right, you wanted to focus on a different client, but talk to us a bit about the arrangements that you have. And it's not just this cost structure that's different, but also the business model and how you arrange and create value, not just for you, but also the other entrepreneurs and their needs. Could you share a little bit about how this is structured differently than maybe a traditional firm? Yeah, absolutely. So I went out three and a half years ago with the idea of trying to start my own firm um, and wanted to target that market, that entrepreneur small business. And so I went out and I tried to do a little bit of what um, my old firm did where I gave a better price uh, for small clients that wanted to be able to get involved. But I also started to realize that the traditional market of um, law happens one of two ways. Either you say, hey, uh, you know, Tyler, you've got a small business. You're, you want legal research or you want me to do some legal research or review your contract. That's going to be maybe three or four hours. However, I don't necessarily trust that you're going to pay me on the back end. So I need to take $5,000 of your money, put it into a bank account that makes no interest, and I'm going to bill against it. And you, Tyler, are sitting there thinking, oh, that's my working capital right now. I need money to make money. So ultimately, I then realized that, you know, most people who are entrepreneurs and small businesses are in this generation that's uh, late millennials, early Gen Y, who grew up with Netflix and subscription processes. And so I started realizing that there was an opportunity to be able to provide legal services on a subscription basis. Um, I have been doing this long enough that I can have a client come to me and say, hey, you know, uh, Dirk says, I need X, Y, and Z services. And I'll say, okay, I'm thinking in total for this year with those services you need, plus things I know that you probably don't need, but I know you're going to. Uh, in this year, you're going to need 25 hours for the year. Now, instead of me saying I want that all up front or I'm going to bill you as I use it, say I want you to commit to me that you're going to give me 25 hours because I know you've got them there. And I'm going to bill you monthly on a recurring basis and make it so that it's budgetable for you. You get to maintain your capital as long as you want to. And ultimately, it's something that you don't have to worry about hindering your ability to grow. So that's the the new model I've grown out is uh, a, a part of a subscription based services that I provide that are, you know, 300 a month, 500 a month, or for some of my larger clients, 1000 a month. But for them, they're getting such great value because they know that they can maintain their capital. And my perspective is I don't care if, you know, Dirk wants all that work done up front. That's fine. You know, in the back end, I will get my money and I'm OK doing the work now and fronting that experience and the services. And I also trust that you're going to pay me because I sit here as a lawyer and say, trust what I'm telling you. Uh, I, part of that should be I trust you back and I trust you're going to pay me. And then on the back end, I'm a lawyer. So if you don't. I know what to do. Um, that's a built in cost. So you, you've shown how you create value, not just for prices, or for how they can structure their capital in terms of how, when they when they use it and, and deploy it, but you also create a different value network or the value prop with your network of vetted professional services that you have within your platform. So can you share a bit about that and how that helps and creates value for not just the professional services but also the other entrepreneurs that you're servicing? Yeah, absolutely. So I I kind of expanded this concept of network. Uh, you know, subscription based professional services to include more than legal. I created a, a, a new entity called the SGB Network or Successful Growing Business Network, where I went out and I handpicked it, handpicked service providers that I use or that I trust. And I have negotiated deals with them to accept the same scenario that I provide. So you may have a web developer that I know that I can say, hey, you're going to charge $2,000 for a website up front. Well, that's a lot of their starting capital. Would you be willing to provide the website and then get six months payments and split it over six months? And I've found service providers that are willing to do that because for them, it's a recurring payment, which I, I'm finding more and more within um, the entrepreneur community and small business community. They want that monthly reoccurring. 
it's some form. It's it's almost like having a real job while also getting the benefit of uh, being an entrepreneur. You know, the corporate world where you get a guaranteed paycheck. So ultimately, a lot of my service providers are doing that. So I've gone out and I found an accountant that's willing to give discounts or spread out costs. I found a bookkeeper that's doing that. I found web developers. I found IT departments. And now I've created this entity that you can come to and it's a one stop shop. Everything runs through my entity. Um, I have as an entity from, from the business standpoint, a contract with the providers and then I have a contract with the end user. So the provider knows they're always getting paid and I'm the one responsible for collecting from the end user. So it's a value add for my other entrepreneurs. So for the students who are in the scalability class, we talk about platforms and we talk about two sided platforms and you can think of maybe companies like certainly Uber or Airbnb and these different multi sided platform. But that is exactly what Kevin has created for professional services. So think of it this way. I know Many of you have your uh, side hustles or your own businesses, and oftentimes we can't be experts in all these different areas, but we do need support um, and context. But instead of being able to or required to go out and find our, the best people and vet them, you can be part of this broader network and for a monthly fee and spread out your cost, you can have access to uh, a, 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 a broader network of providers, whatever your company might need, right? If you're tech and you're you're good deep into coding, you might not be good in bookkeeping or accounting and you want this shared community. So this is the value on top of the, the, the cost structure that Kevin is providing to this network of entrepreneurs. So they have this in small business, they have this need, they have these constraints of capital. And here's how Kevin is arranging to create value for many people and, and the clients that he's servicing. So he had to know the end user, he had to know the clients uh, in order to arrange this and um, and create value. I'm curious to know a bit about your background and we always, we can't connect the, the dots going forward. You know, we might have all these different experiences in life, this job, this job, this job. Did you have any experiences in before creating this entity and before becoming Lonzo Law that may have helped you in your career knowingly now, but not necessarily then? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, ironically enough, I my undergrad degree is in tourism event and convention management. Um, I got that degree after bouncing around pre-med, medical sales, or pre-med, um, general business, and then landed on that as, as a final degree. And it was interesting during that time, they told me I, I needed to go out and do the hospitality industry and get to know it. So I went and I served and uh, I, I spent a year at PF Chang's doing uh, as a server and probably the best experience that I was able to garner through my professional time was through that and also through when I was really young as a young kid working as a uh, laser tag referee at a, at a family entertainment facility. Um, and those two things have actually really shaped what my law firm is right now uh, in two ways. As a lawyer at big firm, I realized that law is a customer based service where they mistreat their customers every single day. They do not care about the customer. The customer is never right. And ultimately, it is not about a customer experience. It's about, well, I'm a lawyer, I'm an expert, so you're going to listen to me no matter what. I have come to realize that if you offer an option that's outside of that, people like that. You know, it's a it's a business of necessity, so some people deal with it, but that's also why people have really bad perceptions of lawyers when they think about it. So I, as part of that structure of wanting to break down what law is with the give me your capital, I don't trust you to pay me. I also wanted to create an opportunity where my clients are happy when they call me. That's why I stick with uh, small businesses because people are excited about their business. They're excited about their growth. But also I love being able to have a conversation at the end of it. They'd be excited even if it was a bad scenario. Um, so I learned that through um, the 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 restaurant and serving. I learned how to treat people. I learned that you know there are ways to find out even if you know you're right, how to present that in a way where they feel like they're right. Um, this so is that wonderful. Was part. Yeah, because a lot of our students, you know, everyone has different jobs in their lifetime and their career. And of course, Florida and St. Pete and is big in tourism. So even if we have these jobs, 
the skills are directly transferable to whatever we want to do in our careers or the business that we want to start, including just a simple concept of customer service and the idea of customer journey and what experience do you want to give. And we teach the customer journey or journey map and the user experience in the design thinking and student consulting course. So we can see how this law service business is starting to utilize this tool and this concept as an important differentiator compared to big law or other competitors, I guess. Uh, who would so, be your biggest competitor uh, or who uh, is a competitor? My biggest competitor, there are two competitors that I have and neither of them are lawyers. It's either legal Zoom because people think that that's a lawyer and it's not because if you read the fine print, it says we're not lawyers, uh, but they get a legal document that they think works or it is DIYers. Again, going back to those those entrepreneurs that get almost mocked out of a large law firm because they have a simple question. Um, a, a small aside on that, like every one of you, if you've got a business and you've got a question, go ask a lawyer. Lawyers are will get I, I give one hour free consultations to any person that comes here. Because I want to one, I get excited about your business and I'm excited to talk through it. And two, I'm happy to answer the questions and see if I can it, frankly convince you to buy my services. And part of that is giving you uh, some general direction. So uh, and I am very quick to tell people if they don't need my services. Um, but the biggest competitor is people who get kicked out of these law offices saying, well, you don't have enough hours because there's a general rule of thumb. If you don't have roughly five thousand dollars of generation uh, of revenue for a law firm, they won't even even open a file for you because that's how much it costs them to open a file. In terms of their hard costs, so people then go and do it themselves and you know, put themselves in trouble. When we talked last, oftentimes there's there's some direction that I don't know if it's necessarily the university or the communities. We push people into chambers of commerce because they believe this is a network. How does this differ, or where has some succeeded and some, and why you feel there's a gap or a need? Because we, we often think of maybe this is historic, the historic role of the Chamber of Commerce, but things have evolved. How does yours differ or maybe where you fit in compared to the Chamber? Yeah, specifically towards the network. So the SGB network that I'm providing, um, that is a big competitor is the Chamber because people go to the Chamber because there's this uh, belief the Chamber is on your side. And ultimately, I'm not trying to badmouth the Chamber. The Chamber does a lot of great things in St. Pete. But if I'm being frank, I don't think that they have um, your interest as an entrepreneur or as a small business or as a you know person who's got a gig or a side hustle to the front because you don't generate net revenue for them. It's the same way as the large law firm. Who's going to generate the most revenue? If you've got a $30 a month um, fee to the chamber, you are giving them $30 to be able to receive an email. You get access to some resources, but that short and sweet that's what you're getting if you have a thousand dollar a month membership to the chamber they care about you a lot more because you're giving them a thousand dollars and they want to make sure that you stay um, my goal on this is it, with the network is to have a alter an alternative option to a chamber where you have this network of people who are supporting small businesses and care about small business because every one of you is a successful growing small business and you have this network of people. So, you know, Sienna can say, I've got my gig and then I've got this accountant that I use. So I then talk with Piero. Piero says, I need an accountant. And then all of a sudden this other small business accountant that's local then is also getting other business. And then it creates this awesome network um, that is not what a chamber does, but is almost like a grassroots process to be able to grow that. Wonderful. I'm curious to know what's your biggest challenges or that you face trying to scale your business or to grow it. Um, it, it was ironic that I had so much issue getting into this meeting because it, it goes to uh, what my biggest challenges are, which are taking my own advice. Um, I sit here and I talk to people on a daily basis to say you need legal services, you're not experts and you're going to get yourself in trouble. And 
I was in the same position you were when I started Lonzo Law or what you may have been, which is I started with one client where I had $600 a month coming in for three months, and that's the only thing I knew I was going to be making. And I had my savings, and I knew that if in three months I didn't get new clients, I was going to not be able to do this. Um, so I called around. I got all these quotes for things, and I got a you know quote for a, a website, you know, three thousand dollars, quote for marketing, all these things, and they were all basically all of my budget. So I decided I needed to do it myself, which was fine at the time, but then became very problematic later as I started to grow because I couldn't do everything. I was not an expert in those areas, but I had either one convinced myself so much that I could do it. Uh, or two, I didn't want to let go of the money. I was afraid to, I was living in a, a mindset of scarcity rather than in a mindset of an abundance because I always knew that, you know, what if I lost some clients? What if this happened? So I just held on to it. And now I've grown pretty significantly and am now dealing with the repercussions of having to fix my mindset that I can do everything myself. I mean, I'm just now at the point where I'm hiring a bookkeeper. And ironically enough, the cost it's going to take to fix my books is about three times as much as it would have cost if I would have hired a bookkeeper six months into starting and just paid them on, on a monthly basis to make sure my books were right. Um, on top of the fact that I've been you know, internally struggling with the fact that I have this reminder that I have 600 transactions that haven't been reconciled and my books are so far off the numbers I, I couldn't even make it make sense and so i'm creating anxiety for myself and I, I i will ultimately say when you get to a place you can start to bring people on to help whether or not through 1099 or through employees do it earlier than later because it always if you're proactive about it it will save you thousands and i am living that experience so that is my hardest part of growth right now is it's a wonderful transition. experience because we talk about mindsets and we talk about scaling and growth but you you shared one of the biggest inhibitors to growth because you know you have experience you have a, an expertise in one thing and because of a certain mindset or a fear or whatever the case may be you didn't want to tap into another type of expert to relieve your time to focus on the things that you specialize in so this is a good ex good example for for all of us because we have to realize we can't do everything. We are, our time is valuable in some areas and not valuable in others. And there may be costs not to let go. That's, they could be being more comfortable with ambiguity, being more comfortable with fear and working with someone, trusting someone. But you, correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, while you may need to give up or offer, allow someone to work on your books or whatever the service is, uh, you still need to know enough about it to make sure that it's being done correctly, correct? You can't just say, that's not my problem anymore. Absolutely, and, and bookkeeping is a perfect example of it. And, and through the network, I've got a bookkeeper that I recommend highly. And part of the starting service is a two hour intro where she goes through your books as they are and teaches you everything you could ask and think of about QuickBooks if you're using QuickBooks online. So you can always go in and check and, and ultimately you give people back end access, but you have the primary admin access. If a, if a bookkeeper ever comes to you and says, I need total control of everything, find another bookkeeper. You, you need to be at a place where you are the one who's in control because they're your finances. And then ultimately what I love about having this bookkeeper is I, her job is to reconcile and make sure that things are, are done. And, and I'll give you a prime example of why I needed a bookkeeper. I had set up three accounts in July last year that were three new accounts set up there reoccurring. All three of them I forgot to click a button in QuickBooks, which agreed to charge them. So I was submitting sales receipts to them. So they were getting a, a receipt that said, I'm paying this. My books were saying that I had received payment, but my bank account was never getting paid. It took me two months to realize that three of my clients hadn't paid me for two months. And then I had to deal with not only fixing that issue, but then going back to my clients and explaining how I made this, it, mis this mistake and then had to get three months worth of payment from them in one chunk because I was coming up on the third payment. I was very lucky, again, customer service. 
I knew how to approach it. I knew how to approach them. I built a relationship. They were all very generous and kind about it. But super embarrassing for me and very time consuming to fix this problem and realize what the problem was. So you, I needed to give that control up so somebody could have eyes on it at all times. But I also expect my bookkeeper to give me a report so I know where my money's coming from, where it's going, and if I need to make adjustments. So it's, it's, a, it's a fine line of saying, there are parts of this that are really important that are on a, a minutia database that I don't understand in terms of clicking the right button and making sure I know where it is and know where to check to make sure that my money's come through. But there's also high level 10,000 foot that every CEO or owner of a business should take. And that, that big part of that is keeping control of certain departments and knowing where your money is and what's going on. Wonderful. Sometimes we don't talk about that. It's not that you need to be a master of all these areas, but you have to have a certain level of comfort and control or, you know, oversight. Absolutely. So I'd, like, I'd like to prime the students because we definitely want to ask Kevin uh, some questions that we may have about our own side hustles or businesses or where he sees things in terms of support for small businesses and entrepreneurs locally or nationally. So before, you know, Santa, keep an eye out who might have a hand raised. But we talk right now that entrepreneurship and innovation is cool. Is there anything uncool about being an entrepreneur? I don't think there is. I think being an entrepreneur is the coolest thing in the world. Um, <laughs> I, I you, think you drank the Kool Aid for sure. <laughs> yeah, I and and let me be let me be specific about this. Um, there are hard things about being an entrepreneur. But I, I and, and everybody, it's like the cool hip thing to be like, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a, I'm a, you know, I grew up in the tech bubble. So it's like, I'm the cool new tech guy. Well, that's now generated into everything. And for me, I, I think it's all very awesome. I will say, however, there is a difference in my opinion in terms of entrepreneurship and a, and a, a gig. And I've got a client that I think of when I think of that. So I think it's really cool to be an entrepreneur when you're in charge of your own business. It's really difficult and draining to be working a full time 40 hour job gig for five, 10, 15 years. And then also at the same time, trying to call yourself an entrepreneur and be an entrepreneur with a gig on the side. I think at some point there's this fine line where and, and I, I crossed it. It was three and a half years ago when I started realizing I'm still doing some extra side stuff for my friends and picking up a little extra revenue. I think I could do this. I think I could start my own thing. I could put my own shingle out there and then finally I did. It was terrifying, but there was a difference between that, which is, uh, you know, really going out on my own. And if it doesn't work, then I'm the one responsible um, and staying within a, uh, a 40 hour a week so I could have the comforts of a job. So I, I think that entrepreneurship, being out on your own, everything about that's cool. I think the gig thing or building a business is exciting for a certain period of time. And then that becomes very not cool when you're trying to work your gig while also appease the man or the woman of the, the your, your 40 hour a week job. So these are challenges or decisions and like the crux of what, you know, what direction you're going to go and, and focus your time. I see some digital hands raised. Sienna, maybe you want to um, organize who, who might be next and sharing their question? Yeah, Ethan has a question. Can I can I throw out a, a preface really quickly before we get into the, the question? Yes, yeah, of course. Nothing I am saying today is legal advice. If you want legal advice, <laughs> call me, and I'll I'll have an actual discussion with you. Every every I will talk in generalities. I'll talk to your specific situation and my advice on that. I'm not telling you to go do something. So please don't call me if I say something and it doesn't work for you and you didn't actually talk to me personally. I need to know all the details. There's so much depth that goes into a, an intake. So now that I'm saying is actual legal advice, but I, I will give you plenty of general and everything I say, um, please bring to me, like I said, I'll do an hour consultation with anybody if they, if they have questions further. So go ahead, Ethan. Wonderful. I think Piero had his hand up first. So Piero, you can go ahead and I'll go after you. Okay, thank you, Ethan. Hi, Kevin. I would first of all like to say that uh, your business idea is a very good idea. I would never think of that and I would like to know um, how how was the process of getting more clients through the years? 
Um, that's a really good question. My process for getting new clients was uh, slow at first, but ironically enough, goes back to that other side or that other job I have as a really young kid uh, when I worked in a laser tag arena. Um, my manager at the time now is the CEO of a $10 million a year company who hires me, who then put me in charge of one of their clients in connection because I was arguing against this other client and they liked me. And then all of a sudden they were like, hey, can we hire you? So it was this weird rolling thing. Um, so the, the process is kind of twofold. One, make sure you know all of your, uh, well, it's probably threefold, but two for me mostly. One is make sure you utilize all of your connections, build those relationships, don't burn bridges. It's really, really important. And those people, you never know where they're gonna be. That guy was making $30,000 a year as a manager of a laser tag facility at the age of 25. Um, and now at 40, has multiple businesses that he's in charge of and is making a lot more than $30,000 a year. But I built a really good relationship with him and he trusted me. So when I came back, not came. The other side has been, I. I had a stint where I was in law school where I was a medical salesperson. So everything has a touch of sales, learn sales and how to treat customers with that. But sales is important. Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident that if I can get a client in to sit down with me, that I'm going to sell them on the idea because I know how great my idea is um, and how good it is for their customer or for their, their, their business. And that it's better than anything they're going to get anywhere else, which that has allowed me to be able to build the customers. And the third prong is something I'm just starting doing, which is, again, trust other people, not yourself. I recently brought in a marketing person to try and see if I could generate some marketing ideas and get a little bit more growth in specific areas, which are things I can't measure, but they knew exactly where to go. Um, so that's that's how it's been growing. Um, I've probably, in three years, uh, doubled my clientele basis. Um, each each year over and then my revenue has probably tripled since the first time that I started um, or since the end of my first year to end of third year is about three times revenue that I've made since then I just want to piggyback off of that uh, Piero when you mentioned you didn't make these connections this is falls directly in line with the creativity and innovation class that you're in taking two what seems to be unrelated concepts and mixing them up together to create something new that maybe wasn't there you know kevin mentioned subscription right we said we think of netflix amazon prime and spotify or gym Peloton, membership whatever gym membership and law and now we have something new creating a very different value prop for a set of customers yeah and, and ultimately it's not what i started as three years ago when i started lonzo law i was a traditional law firm and then I realized that wasn't working. And then I had a couple of clients that I realized had some issues and I identified another problem. So it's not just small businesses that have, are getting ignored. The reason small businesses are getting are not getting legal services is a fear of um, who to call. So that's part of my plan is I want you to know you're calling me every time. And the second is budgeting it. You know, I had a client tell me, well, I didn't call anybody because I was afraid I was going to get a $400 bill for a 10 minute phone call. I mean, I'm sure all of you have heard that concept and that thought. Ironically, that woman's concern, I wouldn't have charged her for because I didn't need to be involved, but her hesitancy to get involved, get a lawyer involved or to do that, not knowing who to call and this not budgeting uh, aspect cost her $95,000 in the end. Wow. So ultimately that was an idea that was like, okay, I see, I see a niche. I see this situation and I see a problem and the problem is people don't know who to call. They don't know and they don't budget for it. So how do I get to that point? And then I started thinking, well, gym membership, I, you know, if I want to get healthy, I need to, I participate when I'm paying a monthly fee because I feel bad if I don't use it. So how do I be proactive? I join a membership and then I'm at least have to guilt myself for not going to the gym. So that that's kind of where it all grew, but it wasn't right off the bat where I was like, haha idea. It was this, morphine as I started to go to find my niche and then once I found it running with it we also call that pivoting in the entrepreneurship world or this iterative process Sienna can you quickly send a, a message to whoever has their their mic on uh, to make them aware I don't know where the background feed is okay. but Ethan why don't you take it off next with your question 
Okay. Um, hi, Kevin. So my question is, you know, a lot of a lot of people these days are concerned that uh, whatever they major in, so whatever degree they get, will basically define their career. So obviously, your major was very different from what you ended up doing, but you did use the knowledge you learned while getting that major, and uh, you're applying it now. So my question is, how did the transition look like to getting the major to where you are now, like into law with no experience prior? Uh, so that's an interesting aspect of it. The, the biggest part for me is that I graduated in 2009, which until COVID was the greatest recession that had been around in my lifetime. So I graduated into a department where I thought I was going to go get a job as a um, as, as an employee at a nonprofit that I had done multiple hours of service for. And ultimately on the back end was told, no, you didn't get the job because some vice president of Marriott who just recently got laid off got the job. Um, that's a starting $25,000 a year job and a vice president of Marriott got the job. So I was then forced into figuring out what I was going to do with my life. Um, so I moved to Florida. I dealt with the issues of not finding a job. I worked at Starbucks, which great job. I, probably the best job I ever had. I uh, was doing Starbucks and slinging coffee for a little bit and then found this medical sales job and the medical sales job was this glorified catering where I struggled because I, 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 I frankly was not as attractive as all the other people that were selling the stuff. And so I figured, what, what do I what do I do? And it goes back to something I thought about my dad saying and my dad is a weird one because he got a law degree and never actually practiced law. Um, but he always told me that the, the top three people in his law school class were a PE, uh, a teacher with a PE degree um, who went to law school, a social studies teacher and a music person. Like those are the three degrees who were the top three people in his law school. And that kind of gave me the inspiration to be like, I can go to law school and I can do this and I can be successful. Um, so that kind of led me to that. And then just gathering experience. I've got so many different experiences throughout life. My brother and dad started the business. Uh, I use their experience um, every day as a as a leader for me on what I should and shouldn't be doing because it failed miserably and ruined their relationship. But I took the <laughs> took the message from it. Um, so continuing to be able to see that and use those experiences, all you can do. And, and and I will say to everybody, you're never you're never too old to change what you're doing or to pivot. Um, just make sure you take with what you, you know, take what you learn to the next thing you do and keep trying to figure out what you want to do when you grow up because the reality is tomorrow you're growing up more. So what do you want to be when you grow up is always a question you should be asking yourself when you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. That's a good thing. <laughs> uh, what other anyone else have any other questions raised, Sienna? If not, I have a few more for Kevin. Yeah, you can ask a question. I don't see any hands. Perfect. What is never said about entrepreneurship that needs to be said? We we glorify the Zuck, Steve Jobs, all these these Musk, uh, whoever. We we glorify these people, but what is n unsaid that needs to be said? So one of the things that I think is not talked about enough in um, in terms of entrepreneurs and starting a small business is the fact that the best part about being an entrepreneur is you get to do what you want. It's not about the money. Um, there is this weird perspective that it's always, I want to be an entrepreneur because I want to be rich. Uh, and I was listening to podcasts maybe about three, four months ago where they had this concept where they said, well, what it was the guy who started 1-800-GOT-JUNK, sold it, now does business coaching. And you know, they were asking like, what is it that, you know, how did you come out to be successful? And he said, because I never focused on the money. I found something I loved and I set the parameters that would make sure that I was a good business owner, that I was happy with what I was doing. And I don't think people talk enough about the fact that it doesn't have to be every day. It doesn't have to be your whole life. It doesn't have to consume you. If you love it and that's what you like to do, it should. But being an entrepreneur is about knowing that, you know, your big boulders that make you happy and that take you to a place of, of, of success 
have time. And, and my example for that is when I left uh, the law firm, people consistently talk to me and are like, hey, Kevin, what's the best part about being on your own? What's the best, like, what was the moment? What was the best feeling about knowing you went out on your own? And my best feeling was knowing at that point that I could drop my kid off the next morning at preschool and take my time and not feel like I was pushing him out of the, the car while it was still rolling, while also not feeling like if I lingered, I would be in trouble because I wasn't where I needed to be. And that gave me peace because I used to struggle with that and, and this weird concept of, a, a, you know, you gotta be in at eight, you gotta be here by this time or else people are questioning, it gets in your head. Um, so to me, I think it, one of the things about entrepreneurship that gets, gets ignored is that you should be taking advantage of the things that you love to do. If you love to go on bike rides, go on bike rides. If you want to set your hours, set your hours and make sure you have time for all the other things. Because if you don't, it won't be successful. You'll get burnt out, you'll hate it, and you'll learn to not love what you're doing. You take out the love of what you're doing, all of a sudden you're not making money. Do the inverse, money comes. Would you say that doing those things that you love also reinvigorate you and motivate you to focus on your business as well and, and help you be a better whatever? Yeah, absolutely. How many times has anybody, I mean, you know, you don't have to tell the professor, but uh, how many times have you been working on a project and you've been working on it and at first we were really excited about it and then all of a sudden you're like, I have been staring at this for eight hours. I hate this. I don't want to work it on it anymore. Step away. You know, it's it's ironic. It's the, it's the lessons you learn or you learn as a small kid that I tell my son. You know, he plays video games every once in a while. He's like, "Dad, this is hard. I'm getting frustrated." I'm like, "Okay, put it down, go away, and come back to it." And then the next time he tries it, he gets it. And I'm like, "See, you were just getting frustrated, so you weren't really focusing on it." That applies to all things in life, and especially your business. People quit jobs because they hate them. You should never quit your entrepreneurship because you hate it because you got nobody else to blame but yourself. You know, I, I, I do not believe or buy into the, I work 80 hours a week because I have to, because I do this. And that's the only way to be successful as an entrepreneur. I think honestly, most big su successful entrepreneurs find ways to set the constraints of their day and say, I work these days from these hours. And after that, I'm not working. But during that time, I give my everything to that. There will always be times you have to make time for your business that are outside and you might have to sacrifice something. But I also, and kind of picking back off of that, set your own expectations, under promise to your clients or to your, your end user and overperform. And don't be afraid. You don't convince yourself that your client won't let you do something or that somebody's going to feel a certain way. Just talk to them. That's the customer service side of things. I've never had a client ever come to me mad because I told them Tuesday between nine and 10, I go and I volunteer in my son's classroom at first grade, so I don't have time. They ask if I have time during that. I say, no, I don't. They're like, okay, what other times do you got? But somewhere along the line early on, I was definitely in the headspace that I was like, oh, I need to be available always for my clients. Would you, yeah. do you agree that this is about setting expectations, building a healthy relationship and relationship building, and that provides the flexibility, that provides this peace of mind? opposed to thinking it's either the client or you and there's there's like no middle path yeah i i fully agree with that i think too many people assume that their client's going to feel a certain way without having communication Com communicate with your partners communicate with your clients and you do set the expectations if you tell a client something's going to be done on friday or in my case i've told the client something's going to be done on tuesday by 11:59, that thing will be in their inbox but if you don't set that expectation that it's going to be a certain day, give yourself the time and say it'll be this week, send it on Wednesday. You look like a rock star. But you send it two days earlier than what their expectations were. So it's definitely about a communication and getting out of your own head and making sure that you're prioritizing yourself and your needs to be successful. Because if you're not successful, if you're having mental health issues or you're having a breakdown or you're you know, needing to sleep all day because you haven't slept, your company's not going to be successful. Prioritize yourself. And if you're successful and you found a good thing that you love to do, it, it, it will be eventually become successful. We know that you have deep expertise in law and maybe a few specific areas there. But 
we also talk about learning and growth. So I'm curious to know, is there any particular skills that you've developed recently or how do you continue to learn and, and what does that mean and how has that helped you currently in the business and or grow over time? So there's two different ways that I learn. There's legal continuing education. Um, that's a set requirement ethics. I take a certain amount of classes every year to be able to maintain my bar mentorship because law is always changing. It's changing while I'm talking. Um, and you have to do a lot of research on that. I have taken that bit of you know requirement and converted that to my business owner hat as well. So I inundate myself with um, podcasts, books, um, people's success stories. I do not necessarily die. I, I try to diversify the media. I am not a you know Gary V head. I am not a um, you know. I only follow what Elon says. I want to hear it all. And I'm lucky enough with the job, and this is like a, a secondary plus of my my business. I work with a bunch of really excited, cool, innovative people, and I get to pick their brains about what their businesses are doing. So I get to constantly learn and see from what they're doing. And one of my favorite things to do as a, uh, as, as a lawyer is to sit and riff with my client about how they can improve their business steps they're taking things they're doing and that is my absolute favorite part of my job is being able to do that and that in itself creates this little subset of being able to learn because i learn from all these people all these people are coming out of programs like yours so if you hear what kevin is saying and he's learning through his clients formally or informally this can be seen as formally as a discovery process we might call this as a understanding the customer or user, understanding the user's needs. But in fact, he's using this to grow his knowledge because he might have clients from many different industries or many different sectors, and they all have probably very different needs within terms of legal or other services. Remember, he provides also the network. So, you know, it's almost like a continuous way of learning about relationship building, knowing your client and your customer knowing their industry, knowing the challenges within their industry, knowing their challenges within growing their own company within an industry, probably broader legal, like you said, the technical aspects, the bigger law, but then there's probably laws within each, each industry, laws probably on local levels, et cetera. So you start seeing how there's these mass levels of learning that's taking place, and he's purposely, or at least mindfully, using these experiences to build a better customer service, know the client better, but also grow his deeper knowledge in with and in depth. So wonderful example. And he said he even reads books. Imagine that, guys, you are reading books in my class. At least some of you are. Um, and that's apparent by your work. So um, if, if you don't like reading books, audiobook is the best thing in the world. Crash an audiobook as you're driving between things. If you got a long road trip or even I, I used to listen to audiobooks as I went to sleep because they are just, you learn things, you're hearing it, and, and something may pique your interest. So don't ever not learn. If you do, you will become stagnant and your business will not grow. And then you will be relying on the people you hire to be the people who are learning. Um, I will tell you, most people that I know that are successful love learning. They love learning about what they're doing and how they can be better because they want to continue to grow. And that's the only way to be able to do it. I really want to hammer this down for the students who are taking my scalability and innovation class, which I know a few of you are. What was the view of innovation or scalability that we were taking? If, if the word scalability is thrown out there, we might think of it's how to grow a business. But there was one particular way that we're choosing to view scalability and how scalability has changed in different schools of thought. And it's the idea of institutional learning. And that is how we grow, scaling through learning. And this is a perfect example of, of what Kevin has shared about the importance of learning, not just in terms of a big company to build the next iPhone rocket ship or whatever, but to grow even a small business or startup, to know the client, to know your depth of experience, to know the different changing landscape and trends, the legal trends that are happening, legal changes, et cetera. So this is a perfect example of why we view, and it's really the contemporary view 
of scalability or scaling, and it's the idea of, of institutional learning or, or organizational learning. So I, I would like to see if there's any last questions before I round off with a, a couple more with Kevin. A, anyone having their digital hand raised? Or physical hand raised? I don't know. I can see everyone. Um, not seen any hands, but I have a question. This is a popular one. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self or us? Either way. I, so many things. Um, <laughs> but the, the biggest thing is, I, I ironically say this a lot. I There are lots of things I could change, but there's not anything I would change. I love where I'm at and I love how I got here. It was not pretty. It was not um it was not uh convenient and it was not easy but i love where i'm at and i wouldn't be where i'm at without all the things that happened um so i i would say the younger self um enjoy the time you're there don't do stupid things and um be in the moment be present i think that's probably the biggest thing i think you know covid's kind of taught taught us this in some way but also being present has the times I have been really been helped me successful or be successful later in life is the presence I had with my manager when I was 16 has led me to have a really good client. Um, there are a lot of times where I wasn't present in situations where I had such great opportunities, but I just wasn't there because I was thinking about things that didn't matter. Um, so I would say to myself, be more present along the way because there's so much more I could learn from from my experiences. I really love that because it really highlights the importance of what I call the humanistic skills, the soft skills. We don't talk about being present or being mindful in business school because we view this as fluff. But I do stress in my classes the humanistic aspect, and that's why you're constantly doing assessments of your own strengths and weaknesses and creativity, why you're making so many presentations in the innovation course, why you're making so many presentations in your student consulting and design thinking course, why you have to learn about empathy and knowing your customer. So Kevin says being present, that just means being there for the other individuals that are around you to listen. We talk about listening. We don't get taught to listen, but the importance of listening. And these are some of the humanistic or storytelling and presenting and feeling comfortable with our interpersonal skills. These are the humanistic skills that we teach in the class. And Kevin's talking about being present and why it's so important in, ter in terms of capitalizing and then building those skills. And, and I'll give you a real life example from the, from the beginning. I think probably every person in here is a, a great student, a great person, but I've had Piero, Tyler and Ethan up in front of me the whole time. They've been, they've had the cameras on, they were there, they're shoulder to shoulder, they're engaged. If I see any of the three of you around, I now have a recognition. You were present, you, you were active. Um, it, it was an interesting aspect and it took me back to when I was in classes in law school. I made it a point to sit front and center of every class twofold so I wouldn't get distracted because I knew if I was in the back I would, but also because it gave me an opportunity to get to know the, the professor and ultimately forced me to be present even just by being there. I mean, I, the three of you could all be playing video games right now like rocking out Dota, but I wouldn't know, but you were there. Um, so ultimately, I think things like that, that that's the, the, the stuff I'm talking about is it doesn't even have to be being good at sales or being good at talking or being in front of people, just being present and thinking about it and listening and doing things that uh, Professor Diaz was saying, like being there itself and, and taking the time to be here. All of you were here, uh, but I see a lot of dots at the bottom that I don't know if you were here or not as a speaker. So that's part of that being present thing where it can it can really have a lot of value just by showing up and showing your face and looking like you're listening, even if you're not. So I have one last question before we wrap things up. Kevin, you have a unique view of entrepreneurship locally and, and even regionally and, and maybe even nationally. But if we focus locally, one, you're your own entrepreneur. But two, you service your clients are local entrepreneurs or, or some of them are, or many of them are local entrepreneurs. Plus you yeah. often work out of the co-working space, which has a lot of creatives, uh, Station House and Hyde House that have a lot of creatives, that have a lot of entrepreneurs, that have a lot of innovators. And you see what's going on locally in the ecosystem. Is there any insight that you have 
from this unique perspective of helping, being one, being present in this community that you can say for good or for bad or any takeaways from this from this vantage point of entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurship ecosystem locally? St. Pete is fertile soil for entrepreneurs, which is not being taken advantage of to the best and full stability. Uh, that's, that's my view of this. Um, we're getting there. You see things like uh, the St. Pete Greenhouse, um, which I know is trying to take steps. But it's interesting to me that somebody, you know, we're in a city that touts how it has all of these new businesses and all these small businesses and small business owners. Um, if you take out restaurants and bars, that community grows significantly smaller. And it's amazing to me that if you look at something like Greenhouse, which had a pitch night, which I love the idea that there's a pitch night, that the winner of the pitch night got $5,000. I know a, a, a place in Danville, Virginia, the city does a pitch night and the winner gets $100,000 plus this extensive aspect of like a year's worth of really pushing it um, and, and making sure that that business grows because it's about growing the city. Uh, this kind of goes back to what I was talking about with the chamber. I think there's more that can be done for small businesses. Uh, that's where I want to see this um, community go is growing the ability to do small businesses that are not just restaurants and bars. Because I love our restaurants, I love our bars, but so many aspects of entrepreneurship get ignored. Um, I've got a client I just picked up that's an artist. Nobody thinks of an artist being a small, uh, an entrepreneur or a small business, but she paints great stuff. She does amazing things. Her her uh, painting sell for ten thousand dollars a painting she knows nothing about business and has put herself in some weird weird situations because she didn't know how to do those types of things and there's not the support network for all of the entrepreneurs in here um, and that's what i really want to see grow um, that's my insight is we talk a big game but I don't think we underpromise and overperform. I think we overpromise and actually underperform in our city. And I'd love to see that change. But the good news is there's many creatives support network here, including the open educator, including the network you have, including the services, station house, many other places. There are like minded and people trying to grow and make the world a better place uh, yeah. and help. It is it is getting there. It's going in that direction. And, and that's why I say it's fertile soil. And I love the opportunity. I think it's just one of those times, you know, not to overuse the, you know, superlatives I've been using, but strike while the iron's hot. Like, this is the time where we can go a really great direction as a city to really put our money where our mouth is when it comes to entrepreneurs and small business. And we have a lot of options. I think we just need to start keep pushing it. Uh, like you said, uh, programs like this, programs like USF offers. Um, the network. Our chamber does do good stuff. Uh, the greenhouse does do good stuff. It just needs to be more. Um, and I think encouraging them to do more will uh, will will actually force that option. So I think people like you guys in this program have the ability to change that and keep it going in the right direction. Kevin, I can't thank you enough for spending the morning with us. Uh, I would like to give you the last word in terms of uh, potentially a opportunities with many of the students who have their own businesses and or uh, side hustles. Uh, maybe the last word that you you want to share in terms of how to get in touch or how to contact you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my last word is thank you for having me. I love uh, being able to do something like this and I love seeing that there's so many people that are you know going this route because it's such a great route. Um, don't do legal work yourself. It will get you in trouble. Uh, even if you don't think so up front, you may think that you don't have enough assets to lose, but at some point you'll get there. And if you do, that's a great place. So please make sure, like I said, one hour consultation. I'm happy to talk to you. Any lawyer will do that for the most part. So if you don't want to talk to me, you didn't like me, you think my face is not what you want to talk to. Cool. Call somebody. It's for your interest. Um, and you can reach me at klonzo at lonzolaw.com. Lonzolaw.com is has a way to. Um, and Professor Diazio has my cell phone number, so if you want to, you can get my number through him. Um, I, I'd love to talk to you guys as you're growing, and I'm happy to provide whatever guidance I can because I want to see you all succeed. Kevin, thank you. I'll follow up with you soon, and we'll, we'll double back and catch up. Perfect. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you all for having me so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Bye.